will start with the first uh, keynote speaker, uh, Bo Lidegaard, uh, who is a Danish historian. He has made many business things. He's been a diplomat, a senior civil servant, and has written several books on Danish history, particularly about the 20th century. Some of them published in English. Like this one you'll probably <laughs> introduce as well. But uh, thank you very much for coming here, Bo Lidegaard. <coughs> that could process and increase quality of the products, 
and build export markets. That movement, the cooperative movement, also became a movement of what they themselves called enlightenment. And that basically was about education. And it was about the fact that the peasants wanting part of power were fed up with the conservatives basically believing they were too stupid, too uneducated, too peasant-like to get access to power. How could you give power to somebody who knew nothing of nothing? The peasants were themselves revolting against that position and they started to create what was the president of the, this place, the folk high schools. And the folk high schools were a very simple idea. It was simply colleges where young people from the countryside, young daughters and boys of the peasants, could come and learn about society. Learn about history, learn about language, <coughs> learn about society. It was not university, it was not higher education, it was not the idea of being part of academia, it was the idea of being part of society and of learning how to be part of society. And that created a very, very strong political momentum within the peasants, within the farmers. They formed a modern political party, the first modern political party called the left, because they were revolutionaries, they wanted power, um, and this party, the Peasants' Party, um, insisted that democracy meant not only the right to freedom, it also meant that the majority should be in government. And at the turn of the century, in 1901, they got it their way, and for the first time, the system was introduced to Denmark that you could not establish a government without um, the majority in parliament. So the parliamentary system was established based on the big majority in the society. And very much to the surprise and angry of the conservatives, it turned out that these stupid peasants were not that stupid after all, and that they were actually capable of governing the country. And they reached out to control the mechanics of the state and also the power instruments of the state. So this leftish revolutionary movement were entering into the big compromises and the pragmatism it takes to be in possession of the power of the state and of the, of the, of the majority. But even as they did that in the beginning of the 20th century, still basing themselves on a very strong foundation in the economy because the cooperative movement turned out to be extremely successful in economic terms and provided a strong economic basis for Venstre, the Big Peasants Party. Even as they reached out to establish themselves in power, they were challenged by a, another group that they, the peasants, looked upon with deep suspicion. And that other group were the workers in the cities. And those were the real bad guys. Because now that the peasants had acquired skills to a degree uh, and power, they became really upset by the fact that in the cities there were trade unions, and the trade unions formed a general labor movement, very much inspired actually, not only by the Marxists and the and the big trade unions in Germany and elsewhere, but also inspired a lot by exactly the kind of uh, enlightenment movement that the peasants had undertaken 30 years before. And the workers claimed that they would also be part of power. That, of course, was unacceptable. They were uneducated, revolutionaries, they were outsiders and outcasts, and how could you leave power to somebody like them. So over the first decades of the 20th century, a big, big debate.
divide developed between the two big <coughs> constituencies in Danish society, the two big constituencies organizing ordinary people, the the the, 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 the peasants constituency and the labor constituency. You could also say city and the countryside, those dependent on agriculture and primary production, those dependent on the increased um, uh, industry, increasing industry uh, growing in the cities uh, and, and, and in the capital. So those two big groupings started to stand uh, against each other, but very much sharing the same strategy <coughs> to acquire power, namely to educate their constituency. Both realizing that without knowledge, without understanding of how society worked, without knowing the world, you could not really gain access to power. So both were investing a lot in education. And for both, it was not education in the sort of academic sense, university-wise, it was education within the organizations, within the parties, within the movements. It was about very fundamental skills in understanding the society that citizens were part of. You could also say, if you want to be more lofty, that what they educated their constituencies in was politics. It was being what they called a real citizen. And real citizens in the peasants movement or in the labor movement were citizens that understood <coughs> democracy and was and were eager to take part in democracy. Because both movements realized that only by being real citizens, that was enlightened citizens, understanding society, could you claim power and actually acquire power within democracy. And this then became a competition or a very important parameter in the political struggle who would actually be the defendants of democracy. And both the peasants and the workers claimed to be of course, the peasants being ahead in the sense that they had part of power, the, the, the workers, the socialists, the labor movement still being regarded as subversive, functioning uh, outsiders of power. Not much of it yet, of course. We, because we just get to the First World War. But syndicalists. There was, and I have to take you into one little Nuance Danish history because I think it's important to understand the fundamental mechanisms. The big issue, apart from the social ones, was the issue of defense. And in many young democracies, this is a key question. Who controls the military and what is the military for? What are the interests of the military? The conservatives being in power in the 19th century, they controlled the military. And they used the military also to maintain power against the majority. The peasants were deeply skeptical of the military. They had to provide the young men who were soldiers, they were the ones who were out there in the front lines. They were the ones who got killed. So the skepticism within the, 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 the peasants movement vis-a-vis -vis the military was very profound. And when Denmark fought its last big war, the war of 1864, that was 30 years before the peasants really were able to reach out for power, 
those who got killed were the peasants. And Denmark lost the, the war in a very bad way. So the whole concept of the military was also a concept of, the, of defeat. And the big political underlying difficulty was, should we arm, should we invest in the military to revenge ourselves on the Germans, the eternal enemy, the Germans being our neighbor to the south, or should we once and for all give up on the aspiration of beating the Germans and just realizing that every time we tried, we were the ones to be beaten. And it was extremely hard for our national self-understanding, the perception of who we were, to get to the understanding that there was no way that we could really um, to beat up the Germans. That the military conflicts that we had been pursuing for centuries with our southern neighbors had no military answer. Now, you would all think, not being Danes, that that was pretty much a no-brainer. How could four million 